I got to get out of my, uh, got to get out of my ad campaign head <laughs> oh, and in, yeah. into podcast head. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, so you got these questions. Did you do a post and, and ask people for these? Yeah. yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Good questions. Very, a lot of them, like, how do I make money? <laughs> Which is yeah. on everyone's minds yeah. these days, I'll tell you. You guys ready? Yep. Hit it. Welcome to Orchestrated, a Musio podcast where we discuss the past, present, and future of music creation to explore exactly what it means to be a musician in the modern era. I'm Chris Hazel. I'm Mike Patty. And I'm Steve Goldshein. And today on the pod, we're answering your questions. Uh, so about a week ago, maybe two, depending on when this goes live, we put out a post to all of you inviting you to send us any music questions you might have. And whether you're trying to figure out where to get started in music, or if you've been in it for a while, but you're looking for some career advice, uh, hopefully, between the three of us, we can provide you some valuable insight. But before we dive in, you can follow us on Instagram at Musio and subscribe on YouTube at Musio.official for more content. And if you're a music creator and you're looking for great virtual instruments, be sure to head over to Musio.com to get a ridiculously huge library of some of the best sounds in the world completely free for 30 days and we promise you won't be disappointed depending on the, how this episode goes if it's not a complete train wreck uh we'll probably do this again so if there's anything that you you know kind of just can't figure out how to navigate or even if you just want to drop us a line uh send us some feedback or some suggestions feel free to send us an email at orchestrated at museo.com and we'd love to hear from you so let's get into it steve since you're our customer support guru here, uh, I'm going to kick it over to you. How many questions did we get and how juicy are they? Hey, Chris, looks like we got about, yeah, we got quite a few questions. We got about 20, 20 or so questions along some certain themes and a and, uh, lot, of, lot of meat to all of them. So we'll dive right in and see how many we can get through. Sweet. So our first question comes from Jim B., says, I've made a living producing original music for 25 years. I'm now retired, hoping to sell my back catalog to libraries or music supervisors. I've had no luck submitting my music through the website portals. How can I get my stuff noticed by library execs? Great question. Thank you very much for writing in, Jim. Appreciate you sharing your, your journey with us. Who wants to take a swing at this one first? Mike, I'll I think, yeah. Try. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I have a lot of friends that... that run companies like this and there are a lot of composers out there and so no one cares about your music i'm sorry no one's going to be like wow this is the greatest thing ever thank you for sending me this it's mm -hmm. always going to be especially in the like production music world you got to make that connection with the owner and people are so accessible nowadays than ever before mm -hmm. like you can find them on social media or if you know a friend of a friend you try to make that connection first you know, ping them, DM them, you know, and, and just say, Hey, I'm, I'm a composer. I got, I have, you know, list that, that what's the style of music you're going for? Cause you, do you want to target trailer music companies? Do you want to tra target companies that do just music for television and, and just media or, or companies that just do stuff for social media? Like figure that out, find out who your targets are. I mean, it's a little bit of homework, you know, but it's not a lot of work. Just find, make that list, create an Excel spreadsheet and just go down the list. And you, you just yeah. cold email them or reach out to them? And yeah. I mean, if you know a friend, like I'm sure if you've been writing music for 25 years, you must know somebody who knows somebody <laughs> who can be like the in. It's because I don't think you're going to have much success if you just, just randomly email somebody. Yeah. Right. Th because that happens so much yeah. yeah yeah they probably get a ton of emails yeah we get tons of emails even mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and like i wish that we could be like santa claus and give everybody the careers and dreams that they want <laughs> yeah but like it's like then, it's so, there's a lot of competition out there so but the one thing that that sets people apart and the reason the ones that are the most successful are the ones that have built relationships yeah and that's like yeah. number one and then can you compose music or can you know do you have quality it's kind of secondary yeah, that came up a lot in the um in the discussion with Brian uh, about relationships, right? And yeah. I mean that that applies to so much more than just music. It's like even how I ended up here with you guys was through relationships that I had built at a previous company that I worked for, and then mm -hmm. people that we've been bringing into work are because of relationships that we've all had. So like 
any type of professional networking um, is really built on the relationships that you have, whether it's in music or otherwise. But Mike, like you have told us a little bit about your experience working with Audio Machine. How similar is that to, uh, you know, library music? Um, and how did you, how did you get connected with Audio Machine? Yeah, I, I, well, I was working with a composer who was a friend of the owner. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, so Jim Venable, if you guys know mm-hmm. James L. Venable, who did mm-hmm. like uh, Samurai Jack, yep. Powerpuff Girls, he did like all the Kevin, like the early Kevin Smith movies. And we did like Scary Movie 3 and Scary Movie 4 <laughs> together, which are awesome, awesome movies. They got to bring so those movies fun. back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, he, this was like, gosh, 15 years ago. And he said, hey, you should, you'd be good at trailer music. Like, can I connect you with my friend? He, he's looking for composers. Uh, and Paul Dinletier, who's the owner of Audio Machine, I connected with him. And I wrote like one or two tracks. And, uh, you know, it kind of led to one thing led to another. And I ended up writing a ton of music for, for him. You know, again, it was just a recommendation, like a random, like, it's, it's, it's always this like random thing that's like, oh, I guess I'll write a track today for this guy. I just don't know who, that, what's Audio Machine, whatever. Mm-hmm. You write the track and then you realize, oh, this is cool. <laughs> this is, yeah, yeah. wow, how fortunate am I? Because usually, yeah, it's like, you don't realize how cool it is until you're like really doing it. Yeah. So, I mean, I was like yeah. super fortunate to get connected with Paul. I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, that's the, the more you do it and the more you connect with people and the more you're like, not a total jerk. You know, uh, I think that really is helpful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you want to be a pleasant person to work with for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Try that's, to be. that's yeah, exactly. Um, you, you're, you hit the nail on the head at the beginning, Mike, we're going to hear that, that word relationships a lot in, in, uh, in today's discussion. It's, it's a central theme of, of the answers we have to the questions that people, uh, submitted and, and it's a very important thing. So yeah, I'll reiterate that, that advice as well, uh, to Jim, if you know, you, in your, in your composing career, you must have some people in your Rolodex who can, who can get you hooked in with who's doing this in, in the, you know, the modern era, which has changed in just the last couple of years, the, the, Mm -hmm. uh, areas around library music and, and all of that have drastically changed in just in, in, a uh, very, very short amount of time here. So it is definitely a challenge nowadays. And, and, you know, I'm sorry that you haven't had luck so far, but I do think that there's a way, a way for you to, to leverage the connections you've made over the course of your career and, and find someone who can help you with that now. So um, I, I do have a question yeah, uh, just for, for people who might be listening, who might not know what library music is. Oh yeah. Um, cool. Can you, can you describe like the difference between composing for library music versus, you know, scoring to picture versus, you know, like what are the, what are the sort of the different avenues that one can take as a composer? This is another, another place where we have a, in our space, in our niche space of the music industry, we have words that have like 40 million different meanings, like the word sample and the word library yeah. both have like 15 different things. Um, so yeah, a music library is, music that's available for music editors and and people who are creating media directors and and producers to simply grab a track that already exists as opposed to Mm -hmm. having a composer hired for that bespoke project whether it's a full film or a short or a youtube clip um whatever whatever circumstances someone needs music there's they're either going to hire a composer to do it or they're going to find music that exists already and and get it from there. So a music library in this context is cinematic orchestral primarily, or whatever type of music it is that is pre-existing and in a big catalog that people can pick from and cut parts out of. So um, that's kind of the broad strokes of it. Uh, Mike, you, you know, you, you know a lot more about the details of, of those differences and how those agreements are structured. Yeah. Yeah. Another word for it is it's like production music and, um, kind of going back to this other guy or anybody, there's this uh, organization called the Production Music Association. And every year they have a conference in Los Angeles. It's like all the production music companies come together, try to support one another. I know that they try to take some like legal action to protect against their composer's rights and things like this. And so I know the pmamusic.com, just something that came to mind. Check them out because they're really cool. I know we've sponsored some of their things, um, their events. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's music that you, it's, it's, again, this is like, 
it's like risk versus reward. Like writing production music often doesn't get paid up front. You yeah. very rarely get paid something. Uh, maybe someone will have you write this really complex piece of music for a hundred bucks, you know, or 200 bucks. But then once it's licensed, if it's for a big movie campaign, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the ultimate, if you can have that happen, or if it's licensed for an, a national commercial or something like that, you know, that's a five figure number. Uh, but right. most of the stuff is going to be placements that will air on television or will be used in, in television shows like Netflix and stuff. Um, but it's like, it's kind of like fishing, you know, you're just going to put the bait out in the water and just, uh, just make sure it's really good bait. Make sure it's the kind of bait that you want to catch the fish with. Because when you're writing production music, you, you have to think about what an editor is looking for. And Chris knows this. Right. He goes through this. He's constantly clicking through music to create mm -hmm. videos. If there's a certain style. There's a certain, like, you just want it to stay in a certain vibe for a certain period of time. Or maybe at every 10 seconds, there's at least some kind of a hit or something that you can cut to. Yeah, uh, it can be, it can know, be really hard to find a piece of music that fits, that fits your project the way that you need it to fit your right. project. There's a lot of, usually a lot of editing that goes into that after the fact. Uh, what I could say is if, if anybody doesn't quite fully grasp uh, what library music is, I would say it's sort of akin to <clears throat> being somebody that creates stock footage and then mm -hmm. puts it up on a website where people can go browse that stock footage yep. or photos and finds what they need, downloads it, uses it in their project. And there are smaller uh, music libraries, which according to our conversation with Brian, depending on who, you know, the owner of that library's relationships might actually be more advantageous because if the, if the library is smaller, your, uh, your music gets more exposure and the owner might have really good relationships with people where they have repeat business versus, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, uploading your tracks to uh, a website like Artlist, which is what I use to browse for music. Um, mm -hmm. That's a really easy way. I, 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 I don't know what Artlist's setup is, but it seems like the type of place where you can just sign up to upload music. Um, I'm sure that there's some kind of process that you have to go through that, but it's maybe not as much about developing relationships with the owners of Artlist as much as it is, you know, signing up and just uploading your music. But the flip side of that is there's so much music there that right. people are just, you know, like when I go on an art list, I'm just scrolling through like thousands and thousands of tracks and just clicking on the first one that I'm like, okay, that's, that's a vibe. But I would say it's a lot like stock footage or photos or yeah. things like that. That's a, that's a perfect analogy. And so there's uh, a lot, one of the, the best ways to get experience if you're new to, to writing orchestral film music or music for media at all. And you just co and you just want practice writing tracks that would be good enough to go in a music library is a great way to build your chops and build your skill set and, and simply keep, keep the machine oiled and, and do that you mm -hmm. know, whenever you have a track that you're, Oh, I don't know what this track is going to be used for. That's okay. Maybe, maybe you submit it to a library and someone else finds what it's used for later. That's, that's uh, the idea behind it. Now in Jim's case, he's got, uh, by the sound of it, he's got a catalog of, of, you know, two and a half decades worth of uh, music that, that is up for grabs. Basically it wasn't necessarily used for a particular project. I'm assuming, you know, I, I don't yeah. know the specifics, but yeah, there's going to be a, an additional set of nuance there where you've got a specific type of music that that's available. And, you know, over the last 25 years, probably some of it is recorded by a real orchestra. Maybe some of it is, is, uh, you know, with, with my, I, I guess my point is that maybe the path is not trying to sell the whole library as a chunk. Maybe it's finding a way to organize it or distill it down or, compartmentalize it and shop it around in, in pieces and, and say, Hey, here's, uh, you know, here, here are people who do this kind of music in your library. Here's my best tracks from that. And then go around and, and, you know, diversify, diversify what you're, what you're, uh, going after a little bit, if that makes sense. So, yeah. And to use, and to use Mike's story with audio machine as an example, it actually might be a good idea to, like you said, Steve, distill it down to like your absolute best work. Cause Mike, you'd said that you, you know, you went in and you just wrote a couple of tracks and then developed a relationship with them and then ended up creating more and more and more. So maybe the thing is, is to just kind of get your foot in the door with someone with your absolute best music 
And then once they discover that you're somebody that they like to work with and that you're somebody whose music they would like to have in their library, you can say, well, hey, I actually have two and a half decades worth of music here uh, that you can that you can take and put in your library. Yeah, exactly. But it has to be licensable, right? Yeah. Like, right. I have lots of music too, but 90% of it is unlicensable because it's um, it's either underscore or it's it's like they're too short or they're, they're not the right style. Writing production music is a craft in itself. It you know, is. Your job yeah. is to make a track that an editor could, will just be like, yes, that's the one I need to get my job done. That's it's, it. Cause like what was really cool, I got to write for audio machine a lot and I started writing for Paul and I was kind of tapping into my John Williams fandom and trying to write this cool stuff and getting all crazy with it. And he would just be like, listen, <laughs> you know, you got to water it, you not water it down, but you got to keep it really simple this is only going to be heard one time mm -hmm. and it's got to get people in the movie theater, you know, that's it. And simple is better. And that's actually really hard to do. It is. Yeah. So like, I, I, you know, I was very fortunate that Paul, I, Paul is one of the masters of this and he, he helped me in, to learn how to do that. So it's, it's a craft and it's like, not something you can't just, Oh, Hey, I got to, I got a bunch of music here. Let me just shovel it and get, and you write me a check. Like it's gotta be, right. it has to be useful and, and valuable for the yeah. purpose that it's intended for. It no, needs I to mean, be, he probably has great music. I don't mean to be like, well, it's like, you it, know, it, it needs to capture the attention of the people who are going through it, I would imagine, but it also needs to be as widely applicable as possible to, to a certain, maybe a certain genre of project or something right. like that. Like you don't want it to have too much personality because if it has too much personality, that makes it really specific. But you want it to have enough personality to where when they listen to it, it stands out uh, yeah. amongst the other hundreds or thousands of tracks. It's like a fine yeah. balance, right? So if this is, this is, okay, maybe this is the big question is like, as an artist, it's like, well, what, why are we getting into this? It's for me, I just, I love music, but I also love the idea of how music could be used in commerce, you know, right. and you got to check your ego at the door a little bit and maybe it becomes more of a craft rather than an art. And that's, that's just understand the job and like going into it with that. Cause I, and there's a lot of people that are like, they would never want to do that. Yeah. Right. They just, they just want to write. Those are usually the best artists, <laughs> you know, they're like the people that are just writing for themselves. They're not writing yeah. to get the approval of, you know, a trade. Yeah, I don't, company, you know? I don't think that I could ever, I don't think I have the chops or the discipline necessary necessary to write good library music you know what i mean it's a big challenge in the same way that being a producer or a beat maker who's making songs ba background songs for artists and rappers and they don't know who the singer or the or the or the performer on the track is going to be yet and they're and they ha and it has to be interesting and good enough exactly. to catch the attention of, of someone who wants to top line it, but also not so weird and out there that it could only be used for a specific song that, because the way collaborative songwriting and producing works is usually a much longer term process than someone who just needs quickly needs music, whether they need a beat to get, get their idea out over or if it, they need a, a trailer or a 30 second commercial spot and they just need it today and it just needs to be done. It's a very different beast. And, and, um, yeah, so cool. That was a, the, yeah, that was a juicy question. That one sent us, uh, sent us to a lot of, a lot of fun places. So yeah, we're going to switch gears with the next question about synthestration, which is the process of doing a mock-up, doing a, a realizing an orchestral score with virtual instruments. Uh, do you have any YouTube clips or uh, material using logic to make them sound realistic as well as the process of mixing and mastering as composers? Mm. We spend huge sums of money purchasing samples, but lack the skills to use them correctly. And the production becomes lackluster. That question comes from Vivian K. Thank you very much, Vivian, for submitting that question. It's a very, good question for, uh, I mean, not just specifically using logic, but any, any DAW, any, any production software that you can, uh, create this kind of music in, there's always a lot of detail work that goes into it when you want an orchestral arrangement or, or anything created with, with acoustic samples to sound realistic and not just impressively good which is which is another way to go but you always there there's a, a surprising amount of 
uh, of specific subtle things that that always make a big difference. Things like dynamics, making things louder or softer in ways that are how those instruments realistically perform. There's a, a common issue that people have where their brass, they, they uh, swell brass too fast and they don't let it build naturally and go through the dynamic layers at a, uh, the, the same kind of rate that the in, that a player really would. And it goes from really quiet to really loud, really suddenly. And with samples in particular, that's usually a jarring effect because we record them playing soft and we record them playing loud. And for some, some libraries like industry brass, we got them playing the recorded crescendos and there's no way there's no way to beat that uh that real recorded swell for things like the brass and so that's another technique is using the right sample for the right job that's why we record dozens of articulations per instrument different playing styles of longs and shorts and we we capture as much detail in the recordings as we can so a couple of tips for any DAW for Logic or or Cubase Ableton Pro Tools using the right articulation and the right instrument for the right for the job paying close attention to your dynamics so your your mod uh, CC1 mod wheel CC11 expression and your velocity uh and having yeah you know, a good Starts with a good piece of music, though. I mean, the, those are more of the production side of things, but those those are the basics of, of the details. I remember specifically when I found out how to make, you know, my pieces sound more realistic. And this is with the caveat that I am not a composer on the same level that, uh, that Mike and Steve are here. Uh, and I don't work with samples in, in, in as detailed a way as they do. I, I probably have about, I would say maybe 10 to 15% of the knowledge that they do when it comes to making orchestral samples sound realistic. But what I will say is that when it comes to playing an instrument live, the thing that makes that instrument sing is the expression, the way the person plays it. And I remember when I first started getting into, into composing, I was, I was just playing the notes and just like, you know, banging it out on a, on a keyboard kind of thing. I had no idea about velocity. I had no idea about the mod wheel. I didn't understand any of that. This was when I was just first sort of getting into it. What I kind of ended up coming to was I break down every section of the orchestra uh, so like string sections, for instance, I'll do the cellos separately. I'll do the violas separately, violin separately, basses separately. And I will play each one all the way through using the mod wheel uh, mm -hmm. to do it expressively, right? And to listen along and follow what I've done before and, and create those swells and all that stuff. It's all about, for me, getting it to feel the way that I want it to feel uh, at the start. That just came from the concept of, you know, when you're recording a guitar, you want to make sure that your sound, your input is right, the way that you play it is right when you're recording it, uh, because you don't want to be going back and fixing too much after the fact, because you can, you know, you can polish a turd all you want. Uh, it's still going to be a turd. It's just going to be a shiny turd. <laughs> so getting everything right in the at the beginning as you're doing it, for me, has been the way that I've been able to make my pieces sound more realistic. I don't know how realistic they sound, but more realistic than they did when I first started, for sure. So now I'm going to actually hand it to the probably pro of pros in the room, uh, Mike, who can actually tell you uh, an applicable <laughs> piece of advice. I think you're, you're, no, you're spot on. So Vivian's, so she's specifically asking about logic um, and how to make them, you know, the instruments sound realistic. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a great, great place to start without having to spend a penny, you know, and the common thing that I hear from, from people that are, that are new to it. And I say this, like, I mean, I have kids that like, they try to do stuff and they're, they, they, they don't, um, yet understand what an instrument is supposed to sound like, right? Mm -hmm. Like if it's a string pad there are certain things you want to do, but that, that the instrument itself, if you just play, push your hand on the keyboard, isn't going to do by default. Yeah. Right. Like a string, depending on what the musical context, you might want to have it enter slowly, you know, and then taper out at the end of a phrase. If it's a melodic line, you want to try to use a legato patch. If you have one, which a legato 
when we write the word legato, well, in Musio anyway, and most developers do this, true legato is a concept where they sampled all of the leaps between all of the notes. Mm -hmm. They painstakingly spend hours and hours doing every single, here, I'll try to play on the piano, you know. Very, very slowly. Yeah. And then work your way, working your way down so that you have it across, you know, thousands and thousands of permutations so that when you just simply play a monophonic melody, it sounds real because you're capturing those nuances of the changes between those, those notes. So, you know, then, and I don't think logic has many of those, but it can really make, it, it can really make the difference uh, mm -hmm. by layering that kind of stuff in there, you know, um, but you're asking if there, yeah, I mean, YouTube I'm sure has tons of people composing awesome music with logic presets only, but yeah, I mean, there's, you know, between Composer Cloud and Musio, I'm not going to try to promote <laughs> us here, but you know, there's a lot of options out there for high quality instruments yeah. at a low, at a low price. You know, what I will say is that, you know, no matter how kind of, no matter how much you mess around with logic's stock orchestral samples, they're only going to sound so realistic. Like when I discovered, uh, that I could buy better libraries, uh, that made all of the difference in the world because there's so much more expression in that, right? And available to you. Um, yeah. So Logic's stock instruments are, are a good place to start. Um, Musio is only 10 bucks a month and mm -hmm. it's got some of the best, literally some of the best samples in the world. And, uh, you know, you can get it for free for 30 days and just and play around with it. Um, and it's gonna, it, it, just playing with those samples alone um, is going to open up a whole new world to you. Playing with good samples, keep your left hand on the mod wheel, and hit your keys a little bit harder, a little bit softer, you're going to go a long way with that. And then just listen to a lot of music, right? Like yeah. listen to it, really think about and analyze the way that these instruments breathe together, because there's a breath that happens in orchestral music where certain instruments may be getting louder while other instruments are getting quieter. There's this, there's this dance that's happening between all of the instruments that creates that sort of alive feeling that an orchestra has. And I know that I just had to spend a lot of time listening to that, understanding how these things sort of work in concert with one another. Um, and then applying some of those, so some of those things that I heard to my own music and you can, again, you can do so much of it with just your mod wheel, just the velocity on your keyboard and good samples help a lot too. Yeah. I think the, the point you made about playing in bands being what informed your perspective on it, I think that's so relevant and so applicable because that, that way of the instruments playing off of each other and, and responding to what each other are doing dynamically and, and the way things are phrased that happens so organically in, in an orchestra. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's something that really takes that, that extra detail to go in and, and do every part individually. And yeah, no, there's no substitute for understanding how you want it to sound. And that, that comes from listening to tons and tons and tons of music, both, both produced with samples and recorded orchestral music and, and watching videos on, on YouTube of orchestras performing is a really great way to add a level of understanding because you can see what's happening, which instruments are taking the melody because they usually, they usually focus on that instrument at the, at the time, you know, the camera jumps around and shows you who's doing what, so you can really know Oh, that's what the brass is doing. Oh, that's what that instrument is playing the playing the melody. Oh, that's how when I hear something like that, it's supposed to perform because they're they're playing it a certain way. Yeah, and yeah. you know what? There's a there's actually this this may be a little abstract uh, in terms of answering the question directly, but when it comes to dynamics and expression in music in general, um, a piece of music is only relative to itself, right? So, like, what I mean mm -hmm. by that is like the highest note that somebody sings in a song is only relative uh, to the lowest note that they sing in the mm -hmm. song. The loudest part of the song is only relative to the quietest, quietest part of the song. Like not everything has to breathe and, and go in and out of dynamics all the time. You can, you can have moments where everything is full on for sure, yeah. but that's only going to be impactful if you also contrast it with moments where 
things are pulled back and a little more subtle. So playing with contrast where, you know, something that will only make as much of a statement as the inverse of it also made in that same piece. Um, well, I'll just say practical homework for Vivian, like a practical thing you can do. To, I don't know what level or where you're at in your musical skill level or whatever, but like something that I know people do a lot of is they'll take a classical piece of music that you really like, like a, from Ravel or something, get the actual score, find a recording you really like, and it could be just like 15 seconds of it or 30 mm -hmm. seconds, and try your best to get as close as possible to that section with your with your mock up. Yeah. And um and then That's you really you really you yeah. really start to find you'll see a score and it might even look like a really thick score with a bunch of notes on it and and then you hear it and you're like, "Well, I guess all I really need is just an ensemble string patch, an ensemble brass <laughs> patch and maybe just the piccolo flute." You know, I don't need to triple quadruple double i don't know there's a million right. things to talk about here but you know i think that that's a good thing that i i uh i used to do a lot and it's fun you learn how to you learn what other composers do and it improves your your skills it gives yeah. you it gives you more more perspective from the 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 highest the simp the highest and lowest level at the same time the simplest form of it where it just it's these core these are the chords that are happening I can play it on this yeah. simple simple instrumentation uh, or I could go nuts and and do every you know doubled and layered and everything else <laughs> but right. then you learn what 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 is appropriate uh, since your question did bring up the process of mixing and mastering I just want to simply quickly touch on that. I view mixing as the second to last stage of, of the production process and mastering as the final stage. And I, I rarely do my own mastering, but if I ever do, I'm doing that in a brand new project with only the, the bounced audio of my mix. I'm not, I'm not trying to apply mastering to the output bus of my, uh, of my logic session. I'm, I'm going to be approaching mixing and mastering as, as separate steps of the workflow. And uh, if I, ha if I, if I care about it, I'm going to hire a mastering engineer who knows yeah. what they're doing better than I do. I, and I, yeah. I, I would say a composer shouldn't mix their own music. If you can, I mean, that's you can a, yeah, find a way, can, if you can yeah. find a friend who's like learning this stuff, you shouldn't be doing both of those things. I know like that's not practical all the time. And like to get, to be able to get somewhat decent and you could just slap ozone onto the final mix and kind of <laughs> pretend like you know what you're doing, but well, right. Ozone That's can me. be a really powerful not an yeah, who, engineer. Who awesome. among us hasn't done that? I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, put, it, put it through Lander. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Just just use R. Just bounce it and then use RX to normalize it to minus twelve luffs. Boom, done. Yeah. Shipped. Um, here's but, here's yeah. yeah. Here's something in, in terms of mixing in, in with orchestral music, and again with a caveat that I'm probably the least knowledgeable person in the room about. Uh, mixing orchestral music. But I remember reading something uh, when I was learning about all of this stuff uh, about the difference between mixing when it comes to contemporary music and mixing when it comes to orchestral music and thinking about it in terms of, um, you know, a live orchestra. So essentially the conductor is there sort of conducting, telling certain sections to come up or maybe come down a little bit or things like that in a live setting that conductor is mixing by uh Absolutely. you know it, so basically the eq the eq knob would be like if you need a little bit more bass you bring up maybe some of the low brass or some of the low woodwinds or if you need a little bit more high end and a little bit less bass maybe you have them go down and you bring in something that has a higher timbre a lot of the mixing in orchestral music is done in the orchestration itself. You know, obviously when you have a piece of music, you're going to mix it after the fact. I'm not saying don't mix your music, but you can, I, I think you can probably do a lot to make that process easier on yourself by understanding the, the, uh, the mechanisms of orchestration um, and learning how these pieces sort of, you know, uh, work together to kind of mix themselves, uh, yeah. in a way. Um, that was, that was super, super, super helpful to me when I, when I learned that and it actually end, ended up informing all of my arrangement in, in contemporary music too. Like when I record a rock album, now I think about it that way. I'm like, well, I actually need something, you know, twinkling over here. Um, so I'm going to do this you know, roads up on up in the higher octaves or something like that.
Oh no, I'm I'm so glad you brought that up because I you're exactly right uh in orchestral music in particular a lot of the mixing, quote unquote, the which is the balance of volume, the balance of frequency and the balance of panning. So left, right, front, back, top mm-hmm. to bottom, the three dimensions of of a stereo piece of music. That that is done at the orchestration level because the instruments, the parts in the score have the dynamic markings put in. So it so the the ideally the play the piece of music that's on the music stands when the players get to the to the recording session or the performance has all the information they need of what notes to play how loud or soft to play them and how fast or slow to to play them in in rhythm the conductor is there to make sure that that is all happening at the correct balance because they have the perspective standing in front of everybody and and hearing it in ways that the players may be too far across the stage from each other to hear. The trombones may not know that they're playing too loud because the violins aren't playing loud enough and the way to Mm -hmm. balance that is for them to play softer, not for the violins to play louder. The conductor knows that and so the conductor is going to do those uh, those gestures and, and bring out those nuances and and find that right balance Uh, but it's informed by the shape of the piece of music and so i i think that when mixing uh orchestral music thinking about it from the perspective of the conductor is a great place to start because that gives you not only the perspective of how loud and soft should it be at what point how much information is happening on the right side of the stereo image versus the left because are there and that that depends based on where the orchestral instruments sit there's a there's a whole the re, the conventions of orca, of orchestral composing the reason that the orchestra as the uh, the collection of instruments that it is hasn't changed all that much in, in a couple hundred years. It's, it's expanded and it's made, you know, there's subtle modifications and alternative things that you can add and subtract. But for the most part, the conventions of what, what instruments are always there and where they're sitting in the, the recording space or the concert hall, that's pretty much fixed. And there's, there's design behind that so that there is a correct balance of being able to hear the woodwinds and the brass and the strings and the percussion and having everything have its own place, not only in left and right space, but based on how loud that instrument can possibly get and how high and low that instrument can can play. As you're listening to other music that you're creating, you you start to notice what's missing a little bit more easily because you can you 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 know what it's like when there is something twinkling over there and it's nice and you want yeah. it. Yeah. So. Okay. Do we think we've answered Vivian's question? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think probably. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look, at the end of the day, mixing and mastering is not going to fix a bad mock up. Get this your mock up good true. without you know. Turn off your plugins. Turn, get, don't don't be don't pull up your fab filter, blah, 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 yeah. crap. Just unless, get it sounding that's good. The effect you're going for. Exactly. Unless unless the effect I see people theory. trying to mix and engineer something yeah. that is While already there. at its foundation sounds bad, <laughs> you know, yeah. like if yeah. it's fake sounding, if it's, you know, that's, you're not going to fix it not- with mixing techniques. I guess that's what we're saying. Very all thorough. right. We're, we are not going to have <laughs> yeah. time to get through all the questions we got. Gotcha. All <laughs> right. We'll get, if you're still we'll, listening. No. <laughs> yeah. oh, we're all right. Move on. Uh, this is another, this is another great question from Nico. How much influence does the conservatory have in establishing itself in the modern music industry? And how do graduates really have more chances to succeed? Thank you. AKA, should I spend a hundred thousand a year going to this school? Yeah, <laughs> or not? Yeah. <laughs> In this room right now, we have two uh, music school graduates from pretty prestigious uh, programs, right? Both of you guys, and then I did not go to music school at all. Steve so, went to Berkeley for four years, right? Yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah, so I, was, so I, was, I actually did. Ber- I, I was at Berkeley College of Music for five years. I crammed a four year degree into five years because. Oh, was, good for you. Had, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a really, really successful cramming. Yeah. It was. I was. It was uh, fourteen semesters nonstop. It was a good time. I went to Hofstra University in Long Island for four years, which is they don't have. I mean, they have a really great music education program. I was the only music theory composition uh, degree. But then I mm-hmm. went to USC with they had that they don't do it anymore, yeah. but they had a one year program that's called the scoring for motion pictures and television program, or I think it's called screen scoring now. Yeah, that's yeah. But like, um, it's changed so much, you know, back in my day, it was like way cheaper to go to school 
20 something years ago. But now it's like, it's crazy how, how expensive it is. And I just would, every per, every young person that I talk to, I try to advise, unless they get some kind of scholarship or something, those loans, you got to pay them back. You know, as much as we hope and pray that the government's going to bail us out, I don't think it's going to happen. Maybe, maybe we, other people, <laughs> not the composers. They're, we're on no. our own. <laughs> so just think about it. Like, and I know that's like a boring real world, like you got to, no, it's loans important. to pay off. So just think, yeah. you know, it does, and when you're a student, you don't care. You don't think about that stuff, but you will sure. in five years. You're going to be like, when that, you know, monthly bill comes, you're going to be like, crap, I got to pay for this thing. So that's from the financial perspective. That's why I would say, be careful, like, and make sure that what you're getting from that school is you want to learn something mm -hmm. just because you went to uh, Juilliard, frankly, or Yale or something that you're not going to increase. I don't think. I don't think it increases your chances of making a career in this business. The most of the people that are super successful ha don't come from fancy backgrounds. No. Yeah. If there was ever a place where a degree is a useless piece of paper, it's in the creative arts. Whether whether <laughs> that's, you know, in music, in graphic design and whatever, it's a good opportunity to go expand your knowledge. It's a good opportunity to work on on projects while you're expanding your knowledge, maybe build a portfolio. But those are also all things that you can do outside of school. And I, yeah, look, I don't think, yeah. I, I mean, don't think it's ever going to make it that much of a, it. It's, education has changed. This is a whole big subject, but we shouldn't go into it. <laughs> education is different than it was in 2000, you know, it and was, it's evolved it, into yeah. like, you can, if you have the diligence, everything you could ever want is available to you on your phone. There's an amazing amount of content out there that's incredibly good <laughs> and it's free. That's the, that's the dirty secret is that a lot of what's happening nowadays is people are spending huge sums of money on college and then they get to class and the professor gives them a list of YouTube links to watch at home on their own later. And yeah. it's like, well, well, I could have, I could have found, uh, I've already seen most of these. Yeah. So yeah. It almost know. feels a little outdated, right? right. Yeah. Like when you go to a classroom, so, you're like, I know all this already. So um, I, I'll say this though, the, I agree completely that it doesn't necessarily, I mean, you, no one is, none of my composing clients have ever asked to see my Berkeley degree. Mike, when you hired me eight <laughs> years ago, you didn't ask to see my Berkeley degree for my job at Cine Samples. So the, what I will say, and it comes back to the theme we started with of relationships, I chalk all of the success that I had following my time at Berkeley through to, to relationships that I maybe wouldn't necessarily have had the same opportunity to discover and develop if I had not gone to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say that for sure because I don't have I don't have that mirror from the sci-fi series that shows you alternate dimensions. But there's there's uh there there are plenty of things that I am very glad to have learned from my time there. I I think that a lot of the knowledge and the experience that I have uh, I maybe could have gotten in other ways. But the thing that made the most difference was the opportunity to have the relationships with professors, with my fellow classmates who are now doing awesome things after, after graduation for, uh, to, to the opportunity. I mean, I didn't even know that studying music for video games was a thing that people could do until right. I got there. It didn't even occur to me. I, I was a jazz saxophone player in high school and that's why I went, that's what, what got me into Berkeley. And, and as soon as I got there and realized, okay, cool. I was, there's other options here. I can, I can do more than just play giant steps in all 12 keys for the rest of my life. But yeah, but yeah. I do, I don't want to like crap all over like music schools. I think that, yeah. you know, I, the coolest thing is you're surrounded by musicians and when you're young and you're in your t early twenties, you know, you want to develop your craft, everything that you're learning before the age of 25 will stick with you for the rest of your life. Absolutely. So investing in that time to really like connect those neurons, you know, get extremely proficient at an instrument, piano preferable. That's, I think that's a good one to I learn. Had. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, studying, studying and studying and just learning. It's always the question of how do you afford it? Uh, you know, and this is, the, and this is the challenge is, uh, 
Yeah, I don't think any of us are crapping all over music schools. Yeah, it's like just I, I'm just maybe I'm just on a kick right now because I have I have kids and I'm thinking about their yeah. schools and I I don't want I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> I paid for mine. I don't want to do theirs. <laughs> I, and I was very fortunate. I had parents that helped me pay for my college too. I had to take out loans as well, but like I'm not like I'm I feel very privileged. Not everyone is like me, so I definitely had a leg up. Well, I know? think it's I think it's what you said, Mike. I think you know there is value in it especially in today's music world where I feel like so much of the music experience is an isolated one um, in m more of a way than it used to be right with, with DAWs being so readily available to people like people are learning how to make music kind of on their own now. And they're not having to go get their friends together to bring all of their instruments into their garage and, and bang it out. And I think that, yeah. you know, music schools, can be a great place to learn in an environment where there are a lot of other musicians and to have that camaraderie, to have yeah. that sort of uh, that group feeling of it. Um, because I think that one of the biggest benefits of music in general is connecting with other people. It's a language, right? And so having that sort of communal experience of making music, even if it's just sort of side by side, uh, I think is extremely beneficial. The knowledge that you would get from going to school is going to be great. That said, let's say you're up for a job, you know, you're up for a project, a director is looking for a composer and uh, he or she is looking at you and three other composers. Your degree is not going to make a difference in that equation at all. It's going to be, you know, first and foremost, does your music stand out? Do you have the chops? Um, I am living for these AI reactions. I, these, I still these haven't figured out how to fix this camera. thumbs up thing. Um, but do you have the chops? Is your, is your music, you know, good to the point where they're going to want to have you represent their project and two, how much do they enjoy working with you? It's, yeah. you know, as a person, as two people working on a creative project, are you, a a, a good pleasant, collaborative person to work on this project with who's going to bring something to the table? Right. Or are you, you know, a curmudgeonly hermit who doesn't want anybody to bother you and can't take feedback? Those are the two things that are probably going to make that difference. And your degree is not going to really pay, play uh, a role in that at all. Yeah. It's, it's all about the relationship with the client and if your music is good and your music may be good because you went to conservatory and spent a, a lot of time practicing and, and doing it under the guidance of, of seasoned professionals and, and uh, classmates who are giving you good feedback, or maybe you're really good at it because you spent the same amount of time on YouTube, educating yourself for free, getting feedback from your close circle and, and meeting other composers and meeting other, uh, other people and, and asking non-composers to give you feedback and, and all of that as well. If you want to get work, and this is a little bit of a diverging topic, but if you, I think maybe there's a better question for this, but so I'll circle back to it. Um, when we get to the next one, actually. So I'll, I'll hold that thought for a couple seconds and okay. uh, we can move on to the next one. Uh, cause it's a related question. So, uh, this one is from Frank P. Hi, friends. Love the new podcast. Thanks, Frank. Being from a small town in Canada, my question is this. Is it realistic to start a composing career when you don't live in a big media city like L.A., New York, or London? Mm. Great question. And very good question. Very good question. Uh, what I was going to say, uh, my, my tail end thought on the previous uh, topic, when you're networking, pick who you want to network with. I... I spent a lot of time in my my early my time during school networking with composers and building relationships with composers. Some of that turned out to be really great because it's how I how I met Mike and and developed a relationship with Mike at the Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, which I only knew about because I was studying music for video games. Uh, but I spent a lot of time there networking with composers, and composers aren't really hiring composers. <laughs> so if you're, especially if you're brand new and especially if you're, if you're still learning all of this stuff. So if you want to network with people who are going to eventually give you work, 
you have to network with those people from the start. It's helpful to network with other composers and other musicians if you want to collaborate, if you want to learn, if you want to find a mentor to help you practice your craft and hone your, your abilities and give you feedback. There's enormous value to that. If you're looking for actual work, start building relationships early and often with people who are studying film directing, game design, programming, the people who are at their own comparable level of a journey where they're eventually going to need music. Because if they have a longstanding relationship with you back from their time as a student or someone new to this, that's going to go a long way. And this is also related to if you don't live in a big media city like L.A., New York, or London. Find the people who are in your area doing things that you want to support. There are independent filmmakers all over the place. There are, uh, there are independent game developers all over the world, and particularly in games and, and modern media, remote work has never been more viable. And honestly, remote work as a composer has kind of always been viable. It's very rare to have, uh, you know, a, a composer who works in an office or goes into a studio, uh, to, to do their job. That's kind of reserved for the big, the big timers who, who do it for, you know, as staff composers at big companies, most freelance composers, you can be wherever you want. Yeah. I would say stay in your small town in Canada. There is no need yeah. to come to any of these cities. That's that. That's everything has changed so much, and I yeah. see it staying that way. Look, I have uh, our friend Taylor da Taylor Davis. If, she's a violinist. She's got like a million followers on Instagram and YouTube and everything, and she's a great composer too. And she's 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 in Michigan, mm -hmm. um, and has built a whole business around mm -hmm. this brand that she's created, doing covers of like video game music and. She makes these videos. She'll come to LA once in a while to film something or, you know, meet with friends and connect. But she is, she's always lived in Michigan, like in a small town and she's doing very well. Um, and she's very successful. If you want to be an assistant and you want to orchestrate for big, right. you know, movies, uh, yeah, LA is the epicenter and you want to be an assistant getting coffee for, you know, famous composer, you know, number six, you then come to LA, but nope. Yeah. Don't come to a big city. Don't do it. Uh, by the way, I, yeah. And I live in North Carolina now, so I, I guess yeah, I'm personally. Full, full disclosure. I am in LA and, and yeah. You yeah. Don't need Steve, to be here. Steve doesn't need to be in LA. I keep talking. I, I don't but, need to be in yeah. LA. I, got, I mean, I got, I it, like you know what? It, I, I think it, I think it wouldn't hurt to stay where you're at, find people who are creating things where you're at, things that you can be part of and collaborate with them on. It also wouldn't hurt to take the occasional trip to these media hub spots, maybe come spend a week or two or something like that. Yeah. If you, if you have connections out in LA and you want to come out and meet people and make, you know, build relationships. Mm -hmm. I found, I, I find that, you know, it can be a lot easier to build relationships in person. So I understand the, uh, the drive to come to a big media hub, but the truth is, if you have those relationships, I, I don't think you really need to be in a big media hub. Of all of the films that I've worked on, I've only ever worked on one with a director who was in the same city as me and who sat in the room with me while I was doing it. Everything else was remote. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, corresponded by phone. Um, and so you definitely don't need to live in a big city. And LA is super expensive. And also kind of like a shitty city. So I would say stay where you're at if you like it yeah. there. If you want to move to LA, that's all that's yeah, a different story. Yeah, I mean, story. yeah, come come hang out. I'll sh I'll show you around if you want to come, but uh yeah, you don't it's not a it's not a requirement to be here because uh yeah, yeah. you can you I can, mean the weather's amazing. It's yeah, it's beautiful. Well, it's it's raining raining like crazy <laughs> right now, but other than that, yeah. Hope this is helpful. I yeah, people should give us feedback somehow i don't know yeah, yeah. you give us yeah, feedback yeah, yeah yeah let us know if we're just totally full of it or <laughs> or uh i mean i think to some degree we're we're all just talking out of our asses yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i know it's i mean there's it's a funny lot actually of... you realize like when you talk to people that you really think are just amazing like like your heroes they actually don't really know mm -mm. they kind of they're they've been winging it as well 
Yeah, there's a famous saying, fake it till you make it. And that's yeah. probably, yeah. The, and the, the, that's, like, that's what you're going to be doing for the rest of your career, yeah. <laughs> your life. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Anyone, anyone who seems like they're not is just really good at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if they think that they really, truly, truly know what they're talking about, they're, they're full of shit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think we got time for one more because this is a pretty juicy one as well. Okay. And it's, there's... There's a few different parts to it, so we'll go through as, as many of the, the sub-questions as we, as we can. Okay. How do I set a fee for my compositions, and how does the price mm. change based on duration, number of instruments, client type, and delivery time? That question comes from Adiel P. We I talked think about this, this is, with Brian. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, great. So for anyone who's, who's new to the pod and hasn't heard the episode, uh, with Brian Ralston, uh, go Ral Ralston, Ralston, uh, Brian Ralston, Brian Ralston at Chris at it, whichever one is correct. Uh, I've been saying Ralston. <laughs> uh, Mike, going, you know, I, I actually don't know. <laughs> I think it's Ralston. Well, Okay, well, uh, with, with apologies to Brian for not knowing which uh, which is the correct pronunciation. It's a great episode of the podcast, great discussion, mm -hmm. and he had some really awesome advice. Uh, and and he's uh, doing his seminar that's all about this this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But I think this is this is one of those questions of of setting fees. These are the num like no one likes to say the numbers. There's that saying in business: the first person to say the number loses. Yeah. Do you have Do you ever have that 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 um that conversation? That's like, uh, so what's your fee? And you go, well, I don't know. What's your budget? Yes. I was, <laughs> yep. Exactly. And it becomes the Spider Man pointing at each yeah, other. Yeah. Uh, you know, which uh, and you just go in circles like that for for a long time. Yeah. There are certain conventions that people follow. Some some composers will say, I'll charge a flat fee of 10% of the budget, or they'll have a flat fee of X thousand dollars or X dozen thousand dollars, depending on their their uh, their level and their rate. Um, and this is why this is why these things are so difficult to give a definitive answer. Like, I wish I could just say to everyone, you know, everyone who asks how much should I charge? I wish I could just say $1 million and, 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 you know, hope that, mm -hmm. that, that, that would be an acceptable thing, but that's just not, you know, that's not realistic. That's not, uh, what, what people pay for music. Yeah. Um, well, in the, in the, in the podcast with Brian, he, he clarifies that there is no formula for this. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, I think that, I think honestly, the first step from my perspective is getting to a point where you understand that your music has value, that your service and your ability to create music has value. That's a big leap in and of itself. It's taken me, you know, years and years and years to get to the point where it's like, actually, you know what, this is worth somebody giving me money for. And I, I still, I still struggle with that, by the way, whenever somebody wants to pay me to do music, I, I go, okay, uh, <laughs> it, it, how much is this worth? I have to go through that whole process again. Yeah. Um, but like, once, once you understand or, or, or believe that your skill in this area is worth somebody paying you for it, then you can start to ask yourself the question, how much is this worth to me? I think like, yeah. how much do I think it should be worth? And then you can break it down. I think in a, in a way that works for you in negotiating with the project. I know Mike, like you had said that you, you have a permanent rate. Uh, mm -hmm. that per minute of, of, uh, delivered music for me, I'll usually give a, a, a project flat fee, but I've sort of done the math in the back of my head of how long I think the project will take. So th actually this is a good, this is a good example. So I've worked on both like feature films, uh, like narrative feature films and documentary films. And they're vi two very, very different experiences as a composer. Uh, you know, a feature film, narrative feature film, depending on the type of film, there actually may not be that much music in it. And usually what you want to do is, or what I try to do is the very first thing I do when looking at a film is going through and figuring out where there shouldn't be music. Mm -hmm. Right. And you might actually find that there's not a whole lot of music that you have to compose. You just have to compose the right music. A documentary on mm -hmm. the other hand is just people sitting and talking for the most part. So there's going to be way more music in a documentary because it's more of a, a driver of the narrative, right? It's usually wall-to-wall yeah. -wall music in a documentary with very little break. So I'll look at that and I'll go, okay, this is how much this I think this is going to take. And then I'll make an estimate in my head and then I just have to live with that price. If it ends up taking longer, uh, then I don't make any more money on it. Um, 
yeah, I have to, I have to first get past the fact that I don't feel like anybody should ever have to pay me for music because I'm not good enough or that this is something that I would already be doing. And then I have to look at it and come up with like a price that actually feels like it values me to the degree that I feel it should, I guess. Yeah. For, for, and for me, I've, I've done multiple different pricing structures. I've done a per minute rate where you're like, here's how much music, how many minutes of completed music. And then a few hundred to a few thousand dollars per minute, depending on, on the project and depending on their budget. Um, (laughs) I've done, I've done projects like that. I've done flat fee for, for video games. And lately I've changed my, my pricing structure to be based on a day rate where I'll charge based on a, 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 how many days I think the project is going to take. And I'll charge somewhere between 500 and 1200 bucks a day, depending on the complexity of the music. Cause there's what I like about the way this question is structured is there are a few variables already, already listed, which are clearly important to, to Adiel in the, uh, the, the way that they value their music, which is how does the price change based on duration, number of instruments, client type and delivery time. I'm glad that you included that, that last one of delivery time, because if someone needs something, if they need 10 minutes of music on Monday and it's Thursday today, that's going to cost more than if they need 10 minutes of music in six weeks. That's, that's, uh, you know, I may still do it in the same amount of time and I may still say, okay, if I have the opportunity to, to, to charge my rush fee, but if they, but if, you know, the, it, it is reasonable to, to factor in being under a time crunch. And when you're figuring out how to value your music and value yourself, it's, it's helpful to consider, what is involved beyond just the fun because a lot it it can be very exciting when you first start getting paid for for creative projects because it's it's kind of like oh wow the dream's coming true i'm doing something that i really love and and am really passionate about and is a lot of fun and is a a craft that i've honed and now people want to actually give me money for it too wow that's amazing then you, then the reality sets in and it's like, well, the reason people are going to give you money for it is because there's also a, a solid amount of pain in the ass that has to happen with, with actually getting this done to a professional level and valuing your own time and how much of that you're willing to put up with and how many revisions you're willing to do and how many, uh, and, and things like how long is the music and how many instruments am I going, am I doing, is this, is this five minutes of music that is four tracks of simple synths and a drum machine, or is that, that is mostly pads and, and, uh, you know, a four bar loop for, for two of the five minutes, uh, or is this really densely orchestrated complex material with a lot of tempo changes and time changes and, and detailed dynamics work that has to be done on 36 different melodic tracks and all of these things, because that changes the equation for sure. And being able to understand how you may value having to do those things or having to put up with all that ahead of time is, is good to factor into your rates and your negotiation. So, I mean, I mean, it's just, it's, it's like so much information, right? Like, (laughs) um, (laughs) if you can, the ideal is, is to have someone else do this for you. Like (laughs) that's ultimately what you want to have. You should be the universal truth. (laughs) You be the creative and focus on just being amazing this genius composer who just delivers the awesome thing. Okay. Someone else ideally should be uh, advocating on your behalf, Mm -hmm. but that's not, and when you're first starting out, you're not going to, you're not going to do that. So I think we're talking to somebody who's, who's just starting out. So really simply, it should be a per minute rate that you have to come up with that, you know, is fair. And you got to factor. There's a lot of things that I think young people don't consider. And that's, you know, um, 20, 30% of it goes to uncle Sam. Okay. So, right. so, so just immediately delete like 30% of whatever that final number will be, Yeah, you know, and there's all sorts of other expenses that you don't realize that you have. And you think, yeah. oh man, I'm getting $20,000 for this project. Mm-hmm. That's going to take three months. Okay. Right. Um, it sounds like a lot of money. And I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, if I got $20,000, that's it. I'm good. I'm retiring, you know? Right. <laughs> um, but then you realize like, okay, that, oh, that goes very quickly. It um, does. Yeah. The, yeah. Like rent musicians that you might pay for. So right. don't, don't undersell yourself. Right. Buffer, like put, 
aim high, like go for it and ask for the high number. Who cares about your experience? None of that stuff matters. Just what's the number that you feel is really, don't go crazy. Like don't say, like Steve yeah, was saying, a million dollars. dollars. Like, yeah. Come up with like, yeah, if it's, if it's <laughs> 10 minutes of music, throw out a number that you feel is like, will work for you. And it, look, it all comes out into, did you have a good conversation with them? Do you have a really like ask lots of questions so you can really get a good feel for what this project is going to be. This isn't like, we're not plumbers or electricians. This is always, every project is totally different. Meaning like it's, you can't really guess what it's going to be, but you can get close. Just, yeah, ask, ask for the high number and see what yeah. happens. You know, yeah. obviously if, you know, look, if Disney's paying for it, if there's a big company right. that has been deep pockets, then you then go you, high. Th- yeah. Then you go high. Really high. Let them, but you let go, them be, because you know. guess what? If they lower it, then you, then you're the hero doing them a favor. You yeah, know, right. you're like, oh, okay, no problem. Well, and, uh, yeah. well, and, and expect, and, expect that they're going to negotiate. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you, That's if you're, the, yeah, if yeah. you're the first person throwing out the number, expect there to be a negotiation for sure. And, yeah. and don't get freaked out when they come back with with another number or if they say something like that's that's a ridiculous number they might then say how about this much and most of this stuff is going to be you know i think ascap and bmi usually we've really relied on those things and those are kind of been dwindling so this upfront fee is going to be really important so like start with you know if you're if you're yeah. young and you 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 have experience i would say about a thousand to fifteen hundred a minute is a good place to start and 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 then the more experienced you get go up to 2000, you know, 2,500. I think that that's very reasonable to ask, you know, you, it's, it's a lot of work and there's, okay. There's this quote from, um, this guy, uh, buddy Baker, he worked with Walt Disney. He was like a legend, Disney legend, this guy. And he said, um, he gave the best advice. He was at USC. He said, I compose music for free, but I charge a lot of money to put up with all the bullshit. <laughs> and so, because that's what compo- that's what this that's, job it, is. It really oh, is. Yeah. I I I had a project that I worked on one time. You know, I I was asking them, "Did you edit this to temp music? If you guys have temp music, I would like to hear the temp right. music that you use to edit it." Because the thing that happens is that when somebody edits something to temp music, and the director gets used to seeing that edit, they get attached yes to the music that's in there. Um, and they were like, no, 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 we want, we want to, we want you to bring your own vision to it. So we left it completely empty. Okay. So I go in and I score the whole thing. You know, it takes me six weeks, something like that. And they come back and they're like, oh, this isn't really what we were thinking of. Um, even though I had been running it by them the whole time, this wasn't really what we wanted. Turns out they did edit it to temp music and it was a completely different feel. Right. And so the bullshit that you're talking about, Mike, it's like, I had to go back and spend an, a whole other six weeks on this project that I gave a flat rate for. Right. Mind you. Yeah. Um, and, and completely do the entire thing over again. And I said, yeah. okay, send me the temp music. I'm going to go through and I'm going to make this easier on myself. And I'm right. just going to do a bunch of sound alikes for you because you yeah. already know what you want here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. exactly. And th- this is, I mean, this is, I'm really glad you brought that up too, because that's another thing that happens is the, 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 the third parties who come in and they say, you know, I, I once did a short film that we were, we agreed on this really dark, heavy electronic score that was like the social network type thing that, and, uh, so I do this whole, the whole score and I send it over and he's like, yes, I love it. This is awesome. And then like a few days later, I get an email that, oh, hey, so the producer didn't actually want this. She wanted something that was more like like a like the amazing Spider-Man. And I was like, what producer? Why? Why is there? Why why is there someone on this project who I'm just finding out now after I delivered the whole thing who has final say (laughs) over this? That isn't that isn't you who I've been working with for for weeks. And that was another good learn because. It, it, you know, when you, uh, there's a, there's a sub question in here about, about crafting contracts and, and uh, what clauses are a must have and, and, uh, all of that, that sort of thing. I'm not, you know, contracts are a whole different, different beast. That's another mm-hmm. get someone else to do it <laughs> sort of situation. It's good to understand obviously what it is that, that you have going into it, but, uh, you know, without necessarily having to formalize it so much, 
one of the first priorities should be finding out every decision maker who is who is on the project and work with all of them and make sure that you have consensus with with everybody so that you don't do something that is wildly different than than what right. they wanted even though they told you xyz this is where it comes back to relationships you need to have a solid uh collaborative process with everyone and yeah, yeah people people outside of music who who don't don't create music and don't don't understand how how the sausage is made are often surprised to find out that it's that it's as much work and as painstaking yeah. as it is when you are working with a director and you're talking about pricing something you have to realize that you know nine times out of ten they're not going to understand what it is that they're asking you for so i One think the, i think yeah. to i think to what mike said like you know definitely start high like value mm-hmm. yourself value yourself high Value yourself as highly as you feel like you deserve. Ask for that. Expect a negotiation. They're going to go low and you'll probably fall somewhere in the middle. Uh, I don't know how permanent rates work, uh, but I'm sure that's a good way to start. I think the day rate sounds like a really good thing too, because that sort of accounts for how much work you're going to do. And it's not right. going to, you're not going to end up doing any work for free, which I think is also great. Um, but the truth is, is that. I think the more you do it, the more you, you work with people, the more you understand the type of bullshit that comes along with this, you're going to get a better understanding too of how to price these things and how to, how to come to this stuff. Because the truth is, is that there's, there's a million things uh, that come with working on a project that you're probably not going to think of when you're first starting out. And then that's going to inform what you account for moving forward. Yeah. By the way, Brian Ralston's, I'll just give him, he, um, for his class, he actually, um, he has a couple of lawyers that will offer to help you or give you a 30 like minute consultation. I think having a, even if you can't, if you're like just starting out, having a lawyer is really good. I mean, I know we all hate lawyers, blah, 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 but it's, yeah. if they're on your side, it's very important. And right. they could, yeah. maybe they can be that person to help be the the buffer and like, Hey, talk to this person. Maybe they can get your rate up even higher. You know, that's always good, man. This is like, I wish it was like a clear, this is what you charge done. Exactly. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's what the answer that people want that answer. Yeah. That answer doesn't exist. I'm it's sorry. Really, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. And, and you can, you can have something that works for you, but yeah. you're going to probably charge differently per project based on what the person that yeah. you're working with is used to also. I think we're. We're coming up on being out of time here. We're like an hour and a half. We got through five questions. <laughs> yeah, five, hey, that's pretty good, you know? Pretty good. You know, if we didn't get to your question in this episode, we apologize. Uh, we're, we, we were really excited about all these questions. And I think if we do another mailbag episode, uh, maybe we'll carry some of those questions over and, and yeah. get to the ones that we didn't get to here. Yeah, there were, there were a lot of similar questions. So I hope that if you submitted a question, you might have heard a, a similar variation to the one that you asked. And I hope that we uh, gave you an answer that helps you as well. And yeah, yeah, like Chris said, reach back out and and we'll do another one of these. I think this was fun. Uh, I will say, you know, this podcast is new, and if if you really love the, what we're doing here, uh, we're, ju- we're just getting started. And uh, if you could share it, if you don't don't mind, just if you found that what we offer is valuable, share it on your social profiles, on your stories, and give us a five star rating. You know, if you think it's worth it. <laughs> yes, um, that's that really helps. helpful. That really yeah. is helpful to us. We want to keep this going and just offer this as a free information and we're going to continue to bring really cool guests on and people that are uh, really making things happen in this industry. So thanks for listening. Yeah. Yeah. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, uh, anything like that, you can reach out to us at orchestrated at museo.com. And if you haven't already go get your 30 day free trial of Museo and get creative today. See you guys next time. <laughs> <laughs>